Nina, are you there? Yes. Hi, Nina. Wow, that's an amazing, amazing oh, house you've got. Yeah, it's you... big, isn't it? <laughs> oh, you moved house. <laughs> Love it. It's uh, it's great to see how 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 everybody lives. You know, I, I never knew you lived in a house, in a palace like that. Lived in a palace, yeah. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick get, uh, gave it to me before he died. Yeah. <laughs> right, just let another few people arrive. Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to mute Simon Quinn. First time in my life I've had that power. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nina, how are you doing? Nice. Thanks for coming. Yeah, no, I'm I'm at home like everybody else, so it's it's good. It gives me a reason to uh, dress myself and uh, <laughs> and so you normally just sit around in your pajamas. I actually I always put my shoes on. Is like, that like like whatever I wear up? I I put my shoes on just so I feel like I'm going to work. Yeah. So that's the that's the only rule I've got. But today I did, I did better. Well, it's nice to see everybody. Loads of people, it's brilliant. <laughs> Fine turnout, Nina. <laughs> There's still more people, I'm clicking away. Oh, do you have to let everybody in? Yeah, it's like a manual. Uh, the more I click, the more people turn up. I can't <laughs> click fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Because for anyone that doesn't know Nina, I just a quick introduction. She's uh, from Holland. Are you from? Is it pronounced Breda, the place? Oh, no. Is that where you went that's to school? Just, yeah, that's just where I went to school. I'm from. I was born in Amsterdam, which oh, okay. people. I've heard of and that. Then, <laughs> yeah, and then I I grew I kind of grew up in Rotterdam, which is actually the better of the two. There's a bit of a a thing between those. And then, so I, in Rotterdam, I can. I'm from Amsterdam. Yeah, and um, you went to you did your like degree in in Holland, but then you came to the UK. Was it the National Film School that first brought you to the UK? Uh, yeah, yeah. I I um, I just wanted to learn like you know more about animation, and and I thought England was the place to do that. And especially the, the National Film School had loads of good films and festivals and stuff. And I, I thought it was a really great school. So I, I, I went there and, uh, and uh, met loads of nice people and stayed. <laughs> but you studied, like your degree was that, was your first degree film broadly or was it animation specifically? Uh, so I went to art school in Breda first. So that was in the Netherlands. And there I kind of uh, wanted to do photography and illustration. And then I discovered actually that in animation, kind of everything comes together. And yeah. it was like, um, a bit of a revelation to me. So I, I, I went on to like an animation course uh, and did like, I'm, I just did drawn animation because that was the thing I could do by myself in my, in my room. I think I saw a film that you made while you were there. Um... What's it? Was it called Zal Zalega or something? Yeah, yeah. It's like not untranslatable. <laughs> so yeah. Zalig. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really bad choice for international career. <laughs> and that, but that was quite a sort of graphic, hand drawn. Was it, or it was certainly two dimensional? Yeah, I saw like um, I don't know if you know um, Marie Paku. Uh, she made like this really amazing film, like black and white film. It was all like scratched, kind of etching, kind of animation. And I was felt I was in love with that. So I I I, I kind of made something in well in the kind of graphic style that I thought I could manage because I just didn't know much about animation. So I just thought this is manageable. But actually, it seemed that if you have to scratch in every single frame, that's a lot of work. But I didn't really know before I started. So. What, like, um, it was scratched into a surface or something, how? I, I scratched it into the computer. Okay. So it was just every single frame, I, I made it like kind of scratchy. Yeah, you'll, you'll see it if you find it zaliger online. <laughs> but it's, 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 not a, it's not a great film, actually. You don't, no one should really watch it. 
<laughs> was, um, um, so the move to the NFTS, was that, did you see that as like the place that you wanted to go or were there other options available that attracted you? Uh, no, I really thought that was the place to go because I already went to art school. So the RCA wasn't really for me, I thought, because I want to really learn the craft and meet like, a, you know, crew, a crew and, and, and work in stop motion as well. So I knew the NFTS had a big kind of um, experience with that and all the films that came from there, I, I really liked. Uh, and I thought I was going to li live in London, but then it seemed when I arrived there, I was in a very small town in called Beaconsfield, which wasn't as exciting as I hoped. But then, you know, I already paid the fees and... <laughs> you thought you were going to be in London, did you? Yeah, I thought, I thought so. I thought this definitely can't be a place where all this amazing stuff happens. It's like, a, this is, I know you probably all know Beaconsfield. I think um, Ricky, Ricky Gervais lives there, doesn't he? He has a second house there. So. Yeah. I, I don't know it very well, but I've been to the film school a couple of times, so... Yeah. yeah yeah so it's, um, it's and just just to describe because i'm interested to know what it's like outside if you're from another country what's does the uk seem like a place where there's a lot of animation talent or how does that feel like a real thing yeah i, I mean definitely stop motion more than in the netherlands i mean there's not a, a, a lot going on in the netherlands i think they, they want to but it just wasn't very big and i think the level of of craft is just so good in England. Yeah, you know, it's like um, I think that's what attracted me to it. I just wanted to work on a with with really good people and with you know, and that's um, I think clearly that was the right choice because I think there's a lot of really amazing people working in England. And so. a lot of good talents come out of the film school over the years, obviously. Some yeah. Yeah, now they have like a puppet yeah. department and a set, set design department. And when we were there, um, I'm saying we because Steve is here too, I see. Yeah. Uh, wave Steve. So I, know I haven't seen him, but he's probably out there. Oh, I yeah. Remember, I don't, he might be in the waiting room. I don't remember letting him oh, in. He's always there. <laughs> he is. He's got in uh, the back door. All right, fine. <laughs> uh, um, so... Anyway, yeah, so uh, there was like, there, there was no, none of these departments, so we did most of it ourselves, or well, there was a set design department, that were, but they were not really focused on animation, so I think now it's like, yeah, it's pretty... That was what I was going to ask, because it's before then, when, before John Lee set up the model making uh, division. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's probably even better now, right? I mean, yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I mean, now it's not so good because now no one can go to school. Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, definitely. I think it's going to be quite amazing to have, like, people helping with your puppets. And uh, I yeah. see Joe Osborne there, who is also <laughs> involved with all of that. But um, So he will know a lot about that. But, uh, yeah, I don't really know how it is now because I have never been back. But okay. I think it's going to be amazing, probably. And bigger projects, I think. I don't know. I'm just guessing this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you were there, you made Edmond, which is the first um, clip I was going to show. What's the, um, just before I do that, maybe what's the background of that? How did you, how did you create that idea or how did that come about? So yeah, I mean, at the film school, you kind of pitch uh, a few. First, you you develop a few ideas, and then at some point, you narrow it down to like your favorite one, um, together with like uh, the head of the department and your producer. And then you have to pitch it to like a group of people, like your crew members, your potential crew members, that then have to like write like a little list of like who they want to work with, which is a very uh, I would say very scary time where you know you've become friends with all of them and then you go like oh can you be on my do you yeah. want to work on my film like hoping that they like your film and I was basically pitching this film about a man that um, loves other people so much that he wants to eat them so that was quite a difficult pitch I think <laughs> with, uh, but luckily a lot of uh, my crew members dare to uh, jump in this weird film and um, I think, yeah, with all of those people, I think it became something quite, quite, quite nice, something I could not have imagined before. But um, yeah, so it was like about a man that wants to eat people. I don't know. 
if anyone knows this, but like, or if anyone has the same feeling as I do, when you really like someone that you want, want to meet them. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have that. I mean, please, <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah. No, it's um, not biographical, this story. <laughs> well, I don't I want, to, want to eat them fully, but you definitely want to squeeze them. To them. Death. <laughs> you want to just like, I think it's actually a proven thing that happens in your brain. I, I can't remember the name of this anymore, but it's like when you see a really cute puppy, you want to just squeeze it. You want to yeah. just, yeah. Or you want to just press it against. <laughs> so hard but, but you know it's, that's the kind of feeling and I thought what well, if you've got that in a more extreme way I um, like um, Andy Biddle's comment it says keeping my distance from you lockdown, <laughs> no lockdown in the future <laughs> <laughs> just try yeah I mean um, I wonder yeah, if that mark was on the back of my neck after we filmed together <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I actually had to promise my husband that I should that I wasn't gonna bite him anymore because he said it's not cool. It's, it's uh, painful. So I have to like just. Lay off. I'm not doing it anymore. I can constrain myself. So don't worry, anyone. Okay. I didn't know that about you. Someone should have warned me. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's. Uh, I'm gonna show that clip of Edmund. Okay. The, the big comments I got after pitching it that like you're never gonna like this uh, this guy who uh, who, eat, who eats people or wants to eat people so I did everything to kind of um, to kind of help that so I made him in I made everything in wool which was the choice because I thought it fitted the story very well and it fitted kind of his his um, making him more like kind of literally like softer and like um, also the things that happen like he at some point as a young kid he bites someone's ear off and having that blood coming out in like kind of woolen blood I think it helps kind of soften the emotion a bit like it's I think you can handle a bit more I yeah. think it's quite quite 
amazing for that reason. So you chose the materials on, I was actually wondering about that. You chose the materials on purpose because it would soften the uh, dark side of it a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think every kind of every film, um, I do is, is I, I first look at the story and then I decide what kind of technique fits for that, I think. Um, and this kind of lend itself quite well. And, and I could do, make it myself because I, I was too afraid to, you know, dip into like making molds and silicon. And I was so, um, I mean, Edmund was my first stop motion film. Yeah. So I was so unsure of how to do everything that I thought, okay, I can do needle felting or at least someone can teach me that I know. And um, and I can do it myself, and I can fix problems myself, you know. Yeah. So and I like the um, you've got that the transitions between different places and times and memories and geographies are done with that, you know, the going through the floors or you know, there's these really lovely transitions that you kind of use later on. In we're going to talk about Loewe in a bit. Is yeah. That, something that you'd thought of straight away to kind of push the story to bridge different parts of the story yeah yeah i wanted to make like this um this character i wanted him to kind of start at the end of his life and go all the way back to the beginning of his life and go through his own memory kind of physically and i thought like i first had the idea of building a huge house and you would kind of go through each room and that would all present like a memory to him and dig himself further and into his past ending up in the womb in the end finding out why he has this desire basically so uh, i i well my, my parents are both in theater so my mom is an actress and my dad is a theater technician and i've l watched loads of theater in, you know in my life and i think that's why i always love having you know in camera transitions and kind of physical transitions and really feeling the set in some way I, I really like that so um I, that's why i kind of put that in and uh, i saw this theater play um it was called like it was called hein was henry and it was like this big um uh, kind of house from the top with four rooms and it was turning on stage and all the mind players were like like going into the house and going from room to room and that kind of set it off as well i think it's it's always like a lot of ideas that are kind of stuck in your head and then you think oh yeah i can i can use that for this yeah and then you don't have to resort to like cliched ways of going back in time and going back into black and white or i don't know like a yeah. well trodden trope of how to show past events yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I, I didn't even think that way because I was quite so new to film. Yeah. So um, maybe I would do now. <laughs> it looks like Edmond's just behind you uh, watching uh, what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, um, he's, he's falling apart a little bit. But um, yeah, he's, he's, he's still there. His head is not working anymore. It's just, and he, he's got a bit of rust, rust going on here. But... I wanted to ask you, how did you do the facial features? Because that's like a post effect, right? Yeah, so I didn't have money to make a facial armature to, to buy, like to buy that or, um, so I, and I knew I could do drawn animation. So I thought, okay, I need a lot of facial expression here because, you know, I, I need you to feel something for this guy. So uh, yeah, I, I thought that was a good idea, but then I, I ended up drawing every single frame like oh like so i basically shot all the stop motion first and then i drew every single frame animation over the top of it which was making two films it was a bit ridiculous wow yeah okay. and now i actually now i yeah i've, I've done this a, a, a few more times now with um with blink the the production company i, I work for and um they um they we've just done a puppetry film and with drawn animation over the top and they just had some amazing people in, in the compositing department work on it and they had such a better way of doing it i was really kind of hanging my head in shame knowing that i've done like all that frame by frame and now you can basically track a lot and 
I was going to say, it looked like you, but you did a good job because it looked like it was trapped well onto the faces. Yeah, that's, that's good. No, it was drawn. <laughs> I wouldn't have... Where you have to think of your own way to achieve something when you've got limited resources. Yeah, yeah, you just stay, you stay in this. I mean, the, the school doesn't have any um, uh, closing hours, so it was 24 hours open, which is a danger, really. We've got that little clip of you um, rehearsing with the school kids for that scene. Yeah, that was really fun. I'm called Callum. I'm called Jacob. I'm called Thomas. I'm called Mark. I'm called Lewis. I'm called Brandon. I'm called Toby. I'm called Josh. I'm called Marcus. Hi, I'm called Beast. This list. Here's one. Brandon. Yep. And... Perfect. Right, you're super scared, and I do mean scared. You've seen this horrible ghost. Horrible ghost. Are we ready? Are we ready? Two. Give me one of those. <laughs> Perfect! <Yay! laughs> was that important, that process, that you could go and uh, see some real kids and get the performance that you wanted? <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. It was, it was a lot of fun, just because you've been in this dark room for a year and, and then you get out and we send this clip to, well, we send the song to, to them like two months earlier and they practice it almost every day. They were so excited. <laughs> when we came, I first thought, how, how am I going to make them sing? Because they're probably going to be shy and stuff. But everybody wanted to sing. How did you find yeah. them? That's cool. Uh, so it was from this, like our sound designer, uh, Rob Turner, he, managed, he has a friend that was their teacher. So it was in Lancaster. So we drove up to Lancaster and, uh, and, and I wanted, you know, the kids to be it, I didn't want the choir to be a super neat and beautiful singing choir. I wanted it to be a bit, you know, a bit. You got a performance that you would never, you couldn't have made up or done exactly. it. Well. Yeah, it gave me quite a lot um, also for performance because while they were like singing, like they were like, you know, putting their jumper right or like scratching something or like waving to their mom in the background. And I thought, you know, this is great. I can, I can just give this to the animator and then, you know, he can get little bits of that in. And I think working with actors is very fun anyway, because as a, as an animator, I mean, you, of course, you know, you, you do everything yourself or you come up with, and it just gives you a little bit of a different horizon, I think. I, so no, none of them bit each other's ears off or there was- No, a... but like, this is why you see the composer, Basically, he had to lead that session because I was so bad with the kids. I was, I just said to them, so now someone bites someone ear off, so you have to scream. And he was like, oh, no, Nina, you go at the background. And I say, that, you know, there's a big crocodile. He was like, okay. So I was, I was thinking, okay, you should do handle the kids and I can just, uh, you know, direct from afar. So I, I learned from that. You do that again, or you have done that again since. On other directing? Directing? Kids? Yeah, I mean, directing real people in f yeah. to inform your animation as a yeah, thing. yeah, I have, yeah, and like, um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I do that. I, I really like that now, um, and yeah, we did it a bit on Loewe on the commercial as well, of course. Does the NFTS help you get into festivals? Are you kind of on your own with your film to do what you want? Um, they, they have someone help you with like sending it to the big, some, some big festivals, I think. Um, but you do most of it yourself. So I had like this kind of little strategy 
which uh, I came up with with my producer, em Emily, uh, who also was attending the school. And uh, because we, of course, had no money and we wanted to send it to loads of festivals and some festivals ask entrance money or it's expensive postage and stuff. So I, um, I basically thought if I send it to like all small festivals and it might win something with that money, I then can send it through to other festivals. So that's what we did. So it started to fund its own journey. Yeah, bit. yeah, because we, of course, after school, everybody's completely broke. Yeah. So it was it was the only way, really. And you won a BAFTA. Yeah, yeah, that was lucky. <laughs> as well. the lucky, because it was good. <laughs> yeah, that no, was definitely. Uh, um, I was not. Really... Luck, Nina. It must be something to do with being talented as well. Uh, well, I'd, yeah, I mean, it, I think it was a good, a really good film, like for, uh, yeah, you can analyze it, I just don't know, um, I was just happy that yeah. people liked it and understood what I was trying to achieve, because at that point I still didn't know if I was doing anything good, I was, I had a very low uh, self-esteem after finishing this, the film, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to be really horrible, or if anyone will understand it, I think the best thing that happens is when someone who you don't know comes up to you and says that they like it. Yeah. And how long did it take overall? To make? Yeah. Um, I think a full year. Uh, Steve, is that true? Full year? Yeah. Full year from, from beginning to end. But then I have to say, I only slept like four, four hours a night. Wow. Like for definitely half a year. And, and it beca I became like, I, I was in a different reality. <laughs> I, was, I was in this heightened state for like definitely half a year where I thought I could handle everything. Um, but uh, I think, you know, you have to push yourself. I, I think everybody that goes to the NFTS pushes themselves because they, they spend a lot of money and, and they moved often to, from another country to make something good and you want to make it worth it and I, I wanted that too. How did you transition into the outside world and more commercial work? Um, so yeah so after um, actually uh, before Edmund won the BAFTA I already got in contact with someone from Blink because it won a prize at um, where was it uh, in Bristol and Mikey Please was in the jury. And Mikey basically brought me in contact with the, with the people from Blink. And uh, they asked me to have a chat. And uh, then what happens is that you kind of work on other projects with other directors. So you kind of, you know, they kind of see what you can do and you can ease into it. And um, while I was traveling with my film, I was also working on other people's projects a bit and <clears throat> pitching some stuff. Um, and then at some point uh, I got signed together with Simon Cartwright who made the film Man Oh Man, which is a really nice film as well. Um, also was up for a BAFTA and uh, signed up with him and that was really great because he was amazing in pitching and telling his, uh, all his uh, ideas and uh, I could kind of, you know, learn from, <laughs> learn from it. I want to move on and talk about the Loewe thing and yeah. how that project originate. No, that was really nice. So normally, yeah, you end up with like exploring the, the commercial world for me was quite interesting as well. I mean, I, I of course, I never uh, worked in this world so, so much um, and like dealing with agencies and the hierarchy of like, you know, you talk to that person and then you wait for two months until you hear if you've got the job or not. And, you know, celebrating when you've got a pitch. I thought when so they said to me, you, you've got it, but I got the job, but then I just got the pitch to do okay. it. So I, I was like already taking out my husband for dinner. <laughs> I didn't even have the job yet. So that was a bit of a slap in the face. <laughs> but <Okay>. wow. <laughs> so you were pitching against other people? Well, not for a Loewe, actually. It, or, well, maybe I... No, I was for Loewe pitching on with someone else. I don't know who. But um, there was no... Yeah, no agency, which was really nice. And Bart um, of Blink, he basically got us uh, over to Madrid, to the head office. And I did a kind of a physical pitch there. 
often you start on a pitch and you're like, oh, it's going to be a pitch and I'm going to lose again. <laughs> but when, uh, it arrived on but your, when, it, when it arrived with you, what, what was it at that stage? It was an idea to make a Christmas film for their brand. But yeah. yeah, it was like have... a Christmas film for their yeah. fashion new, new collection. And they wanted to defy all Christmas cliches. So they said, we don't want snow in it. We don't want a warm kind of... You know, we just want an, a, a rich film. I can see Andy Biddle just doing his washing in the background. <laughs> That's really distracting, Andy. Can you put away? No, I'm happy you're keeping it clean. That's good. Yeah, and, and, and they had like this, uh, the collection was quite kind of a medieval based kind of weird collection. And uh, weird, but fun, definitely very fun. So I was actually very excited for this project because I thought, wow, a Christmas film that is doesn't have to be Christmassy yeah. and it can be quite dark and fun. Um, that is, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's a good chance, you know, to do something nice. Was the William de Morgan, um, was that already embedded into it, his influence and his drawing, his designs and so on? Yeah. And that was, that was really nice stuff. Like it's uh, this, yeah, this old English uh, tile, uh, maker and uh, ceramist um, and he was he made really fun um, uh, a lot of animals a lot of nature and animals but the animals were all not cute but they were a bit strange and so he I thought connected that, to Will, um, William Morris and that era of uh, yeah, yeah. Design, wasn't he? yeah exactly and uh, and during like this kind of um, brainstorming session at Blink um, Baker found out that there was like this amazing house in in, in London uh, that had like uh, all all sorts of his tiles in there. So we thought, oh, it would be amazing to use that and start off there. And they wanted a mix of like live action and stop motion animation. Um, or actually, we we came up with stop motion animation. They just wanted a mix of the real model and animation. It didn't have to be stop motion per se. You often get stop frame um, elements in live action, but you don't necessarily get the live action characters in a stop frame story. So was that something that you'd been thinking about doing anyway before that project came along? Yeah, yeah, actually, I'm, I'm, my new short that I'm developing now is going to be a combination with live action and stop motion again. So I was already kind of in that mindset, but then I didn't really know how to do it. Uh, so this was a really good practice. I mean, I don't know if you should practice on a commercial, but uh, yeah. it, was, it was good practice. And, uh, and, but it was a challenge. I mean, you had to do lo all these camera moves and all the matching up. They were all done by eye, right? Yeah, but the problem that we, the biggest issue I think was Leighton House put down some very um, yeah. tough restrictions on how it was filmed because in an ideal world, you could take like some motion control in there that could move fast enough to record those moves. And then you could take that into the studio and reproduce very specific moves that you'd already shot in live action. So all of these traditional sort of avenues that you might explore were closed down to us because you couldn't take any kind of equipment that would be a, of any weight on the floor. You weren't allowed to put tracks down and dolly down or motion control down. So um, we had to figure out a way of, I don't know if he's here, but John Castle, the, uh, the Steadicam operator, 
was basically shooting um, shooting the moves as smoothly. You know, we had to figure out a way of shooting some very smooth moves that we could then try and reproduce parts of and match with stop frame. But it was a thrill to shoot at Leighton House because that was such a spectacular location and had such a lot of history to it. Yeah. Um, so that was that was really satisfying. I'm glad we ended up using the spaces that we did. The look of it was so fueled by brilliant design, like the way that you worked with Gordon, Alan and his team, Yossel yeah. and Sarah that are, and, and some others that are here I yeah. think, as well. And that, that was, um, yeah. for me personally, that was just such a big draw because I knew that, you know, I'd get to light some fabulous sets ultimately and, and have a chance to produce some great work. Was that a satisfying sort of relationship? Yeah, very, I mean, I never want to work with anyone else anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real yeah. problem. <laughs> it's actually a big problem. It's like, it's the best team, really. It's like, um, you feel very um, at ease because you know they're so good and they will make it as best as they can and, you know, with what we've got. And it was a big challenge for them because it, uh, there was not actually a really big budget for this. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they gave it like they're all. I mean, it's uh, it's all made out of fabric, and uh, I think we had to figure out a lot of like, oh, how can we solve this? It was you know, and how can we solve making flowers? But it's still looking quite um, graphic. And Sarah did some amazing flowers that they actually wanted to like ended up in one of their stores. So in where is it, China? Did the fabric thing come? From Loewe, was that your idea that you wanted to create everything that way? No, that was my that was my idea because I first thought it could all be ceramics in some ways, but then to link it to the clothing, and if you see the clothing, I mean, it's uh, quite wild, and there's a lot of texture going on, and a lot of, like, it almost looks like they could jump off the fabric, and it could be, like, a, a character. And I thought that we have to use that. So, um, yeah, then I came up with all fabric. And I, and I love fabric, you know, because it's, um, yeah. it's uh, tactile and, and um, it's, yeah, I think it has a lot of really nice things. I mean, I, I think you don't like fabric as much because it's really quite difficult to light. It's, not, it's not that. I was going to say fabric is brilliant, but it's really, it's quite unpredictable. So um, it was quite hard although I did spend quite a lot of time coming down to the studio to sort of look at stuff and photograph stuff, I couldn't be there like the whole time because there was quite a big build for what, a few weeks before the shoot started. Yeah. Um, so often it's quite hard. You just, you just inevitably, uh, you're looking out for things that you're going to get caught out by that just don't just absorb everything and don't really yeah. give you much back, even though they can look fabulous to your eye. Yeah, but that's great. I mean, that's what I hoped I would experience at some point in, in London, that you could work with a team who all talks together. I love that you called up Gordon sometimes. To yeah, talk about I went to his house. Luckily, it doesn't live very far away from me. Ah. Um, we, we could meet up and he used to send me. But, but that's the thing, that, that's the important thing about all of the jobs that we do, isn't it? That the relationships are at the heart of everything. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, whatever the job is, you need to be able to share information and discuss things together, yeah. um, which doesn't happen actually, to, to be honest. No, it's, it's quite, uh, actually I'm now noticing how um, kind of precious that is because I, I'm now working on a co-production with the Netherlands, France and uh, Belgium and with all people that don't know each other, like no one knows each other. Uh, all the team members come from different places yeah. and everybody's working very hard to make that happen, but it's, um, it's so much easier when, when, you know, when it's kind of already established relationships. And
לא אוהב. particularly with that project so many disparate kind of parts came together to make the final yeah. big action as well as dot frame added another layer of I mean I was really excited to do that but adds another layer of um, complexity and a lot of like a, a regular kind of stop frame job you could just sort of turn up and shoot in the studio but you had to do a lot of recce and a lot of research and thinking about how you were going to marry these um, yeah things together in a convincing way yeah and, and also the fact that I've experienced a lot of times where they have another live action person to shoot that side of it which that that and that person is probably you know very good and and great at their job but you don't necessarily get to share all of the information and because you haven't planned and shot it and discussed it and worked everything out there's this dis- disconnect between the live action and stop frame parts of the shoot, which is just the way the industry tends to work because they like to compartmentalize everyone in their tiny little specialisms. But yeah. for me to be able to do everything, that was a great benefit, I think. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, definitely. Um, There's Joseph Corbin who made the really amazing puppets. Oh yeah, Jason. <laughs> She always tries to hide in those uh, making up, so you probably didn't see her so well. <laughs> I know how she feels. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was going through some of the behind the scenes stuff and some of the Dropbox stuff is that you shared quite a lot of visual uh, material that was of great benefit as well. So there was like Barry Lyndon, Stanley Kubrick, um, the artist, there were lots of film and um, Tim Walker, the fashion photographer, there were lots of images that, whilst not being exactly the same as what we were trying to do, at least it would give you something of the atmosphere and the look and the color and, yeah, you know, the light, the way light falls in a grand sort of stately home that was a really valuable sort of just to talk about, which you don't always really have that uh, input. So, That, that was that was good I've got loads of behind the scenes stills but I don't think it's gonna show very well from my uh, stills, my, stills my work should I try, try it. Uh, can you see that yeah, I can see Gordon yeah Gordon <laughs> is three got trousers <laughs> it is three trousers yeah they're great did you see that moment yeah <laughs> So I'm going to click back and just whiz through so that I think that was probably from the recce so it was very dark in there and just getting a lot of light into that space was really important to just pick out um, the shapes of things. Uh, oh yeah that's a good one. I think this is the recce you were practicing and Gordon was practicing being a model. A model. He looks great. But there was some re- really lovely light in there that we built on and added to and, and enhanced. Because there yeah. were lots of deep, dark sort of pockets where the light, natural light wasn't really picking up at all. Um, so yeah, I'll just step through a few of these. There's Janet practicing. Sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's the name of the model? She was amazing. Janaya, Janaya. Yeah. She was really nice. Not as nice as Gordon in his bark trousers. <laughs> no. <laughs> you can't beat that. Um, fabulous Josie puppets and some Robin Robin armatures there yeah Robin rigging yeah and a bit of the motion control on the set the wood, woodlands that was probably the hardest set to work with yeah because it kept showing gaps in the set while we were moving through it so it, how many trees you added there was always holes in it right bigger, bigger yeah it was a bit insane I'm sure it started as a simple idea. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I love this set. Um, the, the, what do you call it? The moonlit landscape with the... Dragon, with the dragon. dragon. Yeah. With a little pretend model dragon. Because obviously we shot that clean and then we did the actor live action that was comped into that. Yeah, I don't know if that ever helped, but I, I made a really tiny model with the same fabric. That they had on for every it's really important because you just need to see something in the light just to see how you know yeah it looks a bit ridiculous but it worked 
And then we shot that, I think, just with a reference, because then you can look at that reference when you do the live action side. And, and from that angle, it just looks like a complete cluster of stuff, but the camera tracked across through that foreground element and arrangement so that we could um, cut into the dodo sequence. Yeah. Um, which I like I'm... that shot just of the whole, because you can see the, the two sets, the, the, the moonlit landscape, and then the, Steve was working on the forest, the woods beyond yeah. that. Just lots of paraphernalia going on. Andy Biddle doing his thing. And that was kind of from the camera position. So yeah, it was just a, we backlit the moon with, um, I think you see it in this shot. That's from the back. So we had that little disc of gel that we we're backlit to create that veiled sort of moonlight, which I really liked. Dodo. Trying to level up the dodo set. I like these of Steve buried in the middle of the lake. So I think we shot that pass afterwards. I don't know how long it took him to make that, but it took him a few days, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I can't remember exactly. We lost Steve for a few days on that. Yeah. And, and the time only allowed for him to do it. You didn't really get much time to um, block that through, I don't think, because we were really up against it for schedule. Yeah, it was quite, yeah. And then uh, the Dodo subterranean cave kind of sequence, which didn't, which was a bit worrying until we started putting light on it and actually it came alive because it sat there for a long time, just looking like a massive gray bit. But not yeah. very spectacular, but then it just really helped to put some color into it. Yeah. And then that color was kind of matched. These, color, these colors are weird because these stills aren't necessarily graded, but that's the live action element that was comped into the cave type set. So we were reproducing the same style of lighting on a bigger scale and shooting live action and trying to match some of the camera moves between the two sets in a quite a quite a crude way <laughs> but it worked some guy on a rock can't remember his name but you probably yeah, know you saw felix that was felix. Felix. Yeah. yeah and he was he was very nice he had to balance really awkwardly on this oh front. yeah it was wasn't it, it yeah was it was very quite yeah it was awkward for him but i think he did quite good and Martin, he was the kind of creative at um, Loeva, and he. Is that uh, Martin and you? I mean, yeah, he was super nice, and he really he understood, was. like, he really understood, uh, kind of the idea behind it, and just like let us quite free. I thought. Yeah, really, and um, I was amazed because, he, yeah, he just gave you and everyone complete freedom. Really, he trusted us just to do the, to get on with it without. It must be quite worrying that you've, you know, you put this idea and some money into someone's hands and then you get it all the time, don't you, where people really interfere too much because they want to stay in control of it and they have to let it go, really. Yeah, and, and really you know, in this whole idea, you didn't see the clothing that well. <laughs> so that, that was quite, I think, uh, yeah. a bit different from other kind of fashion commercials and stuff. You. Yeah. you there was not a focus on the clothing as such. There was more focus on what the clothing kind of, you know, does, what it, what, what it means or what it kind of, more the collection on, on itself. Yeah. Um, these are some Joe Eckworth still just at the end of the crew shooting on the live action. Toby and um, John. That's a really nice still. Yeah. So that was the Trinity rig that he used to give him a little bit of, it was like you had a steady cam with a bit of a jib on it that was super smooth. That was really yeah. cool, first time in the shots. But it looked heavy, very heavy. And it was quite hot, wasn't it? It was summer. Yeah. Some workshop scene. I think that's the end of just a few selected 
there's so many stills, but yeah, it just gives you a bit of a flavor. I'll stop sharing now. What's what's happening now? What's where's since I did that that finished in um like late summer or something, you've been working on this project. Uh is it beyond the Purple Mountains? This thing that you're Yeah, yes. It's like a short I wrote together with Simon Cartwright and um uh, yeah, we've been, it's been ages, like, since we've kind of set it up. And it's, it's, it's because it's a co-production, I think it goes a bit slow. Um, I mean, I've never worked like this before, but, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a long process, but now it's kind of, I've just finished the animatic. Yeah. And, uh, and hopefully, and it's gone to the funding. Uh, so hopefully they're going to like it and then we can make it. But I don't know how we're going to make it yet as I have to be in France for that. So, okay. And we're definitely going to have to be more than two meters or less than two meters apart from each other. So, so it's a short I, film, is it? Yeah, short film and it's a combination with live action and stop motion. Not as many camera moves Yeah, I, I put in this time. Yeah. So... <laughs> That's good, and yeah, it's it's uh, quite dialogue heavy actually this time because I wanted to really try to make something that was that was a bit more character based and a bit more you know really trying you know doing something. Um, is, is it live action animation mix? Did you say? Yeah, yeah, it's live action stop motion like you know like these old and I want really I have these old kind of reference from uh, from like the. The Attack of the Puppet People. I don't know if you know that film. No. Or like the very Harry Potter films, like the the skeletons in, in Jason yeah, and yeah. Like that old kind of combination. So when, for instance, there's a big actor, a live action actor, and he grabs one of the puppets, in a close up shot, the hand will be stop motion. So we would like. So I would really play with that that kind of old school techniques of like how how we used to solve everything in camera. Um, kind of to keep it to keep it kind of all in camera and also I I like seeing the technique I I, I, I think that's kind of charming so hopefully that will work out but again it's not something I've really done before so and then any any other things that you've got in the pipeline that you can talk about um yeah all things that are a bit uncertain at the moment I yeah. guess I guess for everybody uh that's the same story but um yeah, like there's some, uh, there's like a feature film in the Netherlands that I might direct. Uh, that's an animation feature, um, but it's being written now, and I don't know how that's gonna be. You know how that's gonna go forward. And um, I guess everything's gonna. It feels like there's things that are just gonna slide rather than being cancelled. At least. Uh, yeah. Then. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, and I hope I get some more time in between to. Uh, to do my own projects and maybe do some more commercials in between, so. Have you got anything visual we can look at on your laptop there or is it top secret? Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's like, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I don't have much as them mood boards and stuff because, uh, and of course I can't show the animatic really because I think that's. I so saw one thing on, um, did you, was there a page of like graphic, like reference stuff for the. Um, yeah. Should I show that? Because um, yeah. really I was going to play you something as a last thing to... What were you going to play? I was going to play you a bit of music. Hold on. Show, show, us, the, um, show us the page first. <laughs> what, are you, what are you planning? No, 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 it's nothing. It's, it's a nice thing. I just want to oh. see if people recognise it. Okay. Um. <laughs> Don't worry, it's not a nasty surprise. It works. Hold on. <laughs> So yeah, it's all this. Nothing else has worked, so this it's all t It's all like based on like this old t kids TV series. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear that? Yeah. Do you recognize it? The thumbs. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I just had to hear that when I saw the picture of the flumps. It really cheered me up, so I thought I'd dig it out. This is what I can show. There you go. Fading the flumps away. Yeah. Coming back to you. Really? Yeah. Okay. I like the page of reference. Oh, that's um, Land of the Giants, isn't it? And stuff there. Yeah, and, and this is the Attack of the Puppet People. Which this, one? This one in the right hand corner. And then 
Mm. Oh, I thought that was Land of the Giants. Oh, maybe it is that. Okay. No, I don't know. Uh, and and this is um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Yeah. And uh, and the Incredible Shrinking Man. Yes. So all good stuff, really. Um, and uh, but it's like it's it's a seemingly kind of innocent show, a uh, film about a kids TV series, but. Uh, behind it, you find out that like um, uh, it's not so innocent after all, and the stop motion puppets are actually little living humans uh, that the show's creator has um, Sounds has right. all this time <laughs> in his house. <laughs> so that sounds yeah. great. Sarah says, "Can we make it, please?" But I think I know the well, answer because you yeah. you have to tie it into foreign like the fun co production funds, don't you? Make it, yeah, make if you move to Belgium or France, then yes. Okay. <laughs> that would be great. That. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for saying that. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I think um, that's that's fantastic. I think I'll wrap it up there, but um, I'm just going to leave this open for like five, ten minutes. So if anyone's got any questions, um, they can unmute and they can ask Nina if she's happy to stick around for a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nina. That was great. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, I hope, yeah, I hope that was all right for people. And I'm looking forward to the next chats.